When the Creator saw on the earth here that was good, He called out to that G Doc, that Sandhill Crane. He asked that crane if he would speak on behalf of two-legged people as he was telling them to get ready because we are coming. And so that Sandhill Crane was the first clan that started that process to be grateful of the trees and the plants that gave themselves to be here. We went and we honored these beings, these tree people that we call them, our relatives from the tree realm. We told these trees what we're going to do with it. And that's how we figure out how to do things with these plants, with the fish, with the deer. Ani, Eric and Disnikas, Anamatikamek and Donjiba, Anishinaabe Odawa Endo. Hi, my name is Eric. I am Anishinaabe Odawa, one of the many tribal nations in the Great Lakes. And I am from the place of the prayer tree, AKA Crossroads, Michigan, up near the Straits of Mackinac. And today I'm standing in front of what we call a longhouse. And there are many tribal nations in the Great Lakes, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, the Huron, and many of these nations had different types of homes. And the longhouse that is in, I'm in front of is indicative or common for many of the people here in this area with the Huron, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And this longhouse is made of elm bark, a very important tree for the native nations of the Great Lakes. And this longhouse is indeed long. It can be up to 100 feet long, housing multiple families. So you think of a home where you have your own room, your own bathroom, and so on and so forth. But in a longhouse, you shared all the space. But that wasn't much of a problem because you spent most of your time outdoors playing, helping your parents, helping your community. But this longhouse was more of a permanent home where people would stay for months. Many years ago, along the beautiful Detroit River, lived four Iroquoian-speaking tribal nations. After the Beaver Wars ended in 1701, the remaining Huron, Neutral, Teotonate, and Winro tribes eventually banded together and became the Huron. In southeastern Michigan today, if you see the word or read the word Huron, the proper name is now Wyandot. The longhouse was a very important part of Wyandot culture. When a man married a woman, he would leave his family and move into the communal Wyandot longhouse belonging to his wife's mother's family. Women were a very important part of the Wyandot culture and clan mothers helped to discuss and make decisions. I am a member of the Wyandot Nation and I am very, very proud of my heritage. This is a Potawatomi style longhouse. There were 13 of them that were right here in this region. The Anishinaabe in the uh, 1700s in this area adopted these from the, their relatives, uh, Iroquois, Iroquois speaking relatives from the Huron people. And they learned this way of building villages and because they were occupying these big summer villages like this. Amongst the Anishinaabek, the clan always follows the father's side. This would be a wolf clan house. Everyone in this house would be related along that lineage. This is not only a house, this is a corn processing facility. Now you have to dry all of that corn look up why is it so big because up there you would have pole after pole after pole braids and braids and braids this supports thousands and thousands tens of thousands of pounds of braided corn that hangs down from the ceiling to about this pole here across the whole top the smoke from the fires goes upward keeps the corn dry keeps bugs out keeps everything good you know, we have over 2,000, 2,000 conifer trees in here for, for this, just this little 40 by 50 longhouse that's 23 feet high at that ridge pole. This would be your sleeping quarters right here. This is the area where you'd roll out your, your bundle, you know, you'd have your feathers or your, or your whatever you decide to put down here. And that, this is where you would sleep on. 
And then here's another storage area right here for heavier stuff. And then up, up, up above that would be a, a smaller rack for lighter stuff to go up here. And then everything else would be hanging off the rest of it. The inner bark of the, of the elm bark, it, you can peel it apart and, and, and work it. And then they would have lashings in this to hold this all together. Okay, but, but then you really have to take care of this lodge then. Like somebody would have to live here every day. A family would have to live here every day to keep this up, just to keep it going so that nobody would get hurt. Behind me is a wigwam. And this wigwam is made out of wigwas or birch bark. And birch bark is one of the most important and special trees to the Anishinaabe. We made homes out of birch bark, we made canoes, we made containers, and we could start fires with birch bark. So it's a very special tree to the Odawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe, known as the Anishinaabe. It's a home, but a more mobile home. And these were used when people had to travel with their resources, whether it's a fishing village, to go pick berries, to make maple sugar. You were always on the move with your resources. This is not like a longhouse where you stayed in a place for a very long time, but you're on the move. So the wigwam was used by a lot of different tribes in the Great Lakes, from Minnesota to Wisconsin, to Michigan, to Ontario. And the wigwam was used not just by one community, but many communities. And, but one thing that was common is the resource. And the resource was your, what we call tigwok, our trees. So the wigwam was mobile, which meant it went with you. So this birch bark would be rolled up and you could carry it. You could put it in your canoe and go where you, you went. And the saplings were usually made out of maple. Maple saplings are very strong. They're very bendable. And then they would be tied with what we call wigobish. And this is basswood bark. And so this was our rope. So all of these materials were around us all the time. Our rope, our covering, our frame, and we would take them all with us. And then when these materials became old or worn out, we would simply burn them to start a fire and go get new materials. So it was a renewable resource that the Anishinaabe people could rely on for future generations. This type of house here, if we're talking about the shape of it, the domed shape of the frame, we call it uh, waganogan. Waganogan is the word. That wag refers to something being bent. Does everyone see the stitching down the sides here? So the panels of bark are sewn next to each other, then they have wooden battens made of cedar at the ends. The frame is made out of saplings, young maple or hardwood trees about this big around, and they all grow really long and straight. In a forest, um, you have the second layer of growth where you'll have mature trees um, here and there. And then you have all these little maple trees and they will all be competing to grow to the top. And those are the ones we use. On the inside here, if you look, the saplings go vertically, but they also make rings that go around. And those rings create four layers going up. Those are the four layers of the universe above us. This is a, a miniature model of the universe right here. The doorway is located in the east. It's in the east. We come in from the east because the sun rises in the east. Life begins in the east. In the middle, there's a hole, which is a smoke hole. That a lot. That's your chimney. It's your chimney. It allows for the smoke to go out of the house. Um, there's not the room. This is a little tiny one, you know. It's a tiny one, and they were built this size. But this is just for a like a small family um, when they're traveling to set up. And uh, if people came down here to trade from a distance, they would travel and they would set up a house like this and this is what they'd be staying in. All the things that you own would get tied up to the frame above you on the roof, like from the ceiling and the walls. And then the, the bottom part is where you sit and hang out. And then when you sleep, you roll out your mats and your hides and things for your bedding. The wigwam was used by Anishinaabe people for thousands of years. We had to change our way of life with new populations coming in. 
Europeans and Americans. We transitioned or moved from the wigwam to cabins and homes, but we still have the knowledge of the wigwam in our communities. So here today, we are able to share with others what the wigwam means, what the resources are, and the stories behind it. Oh, yeah.